Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 86 of The Raw Men. And today I'm speaking with Jane Donnelly and Michael Nugent of Atheist Ireland. And uh, they are celebrating another recent increment in uh, Ireland's progression. As I understand it, right, it was a, a quiet revolution. Uh, can you guys tell me what that's all about? Well, I, I would call it more than a progression this time, Aaron. Um, I would describe the abortion referendum vote yesterday in Ireland as uh, the fall of Ireland's Catholic Berlin Wall. And it, it's removing essentially a, a symbolic constitutional provision that had trapped a, a people that are increasingly pluralist within a constitution that was essentially Catholic. And we're finally starting to get rid of that now. Well, I'm yeah. happy to hear it. I mean, I've heard that, that I remember it, it was uh, like 1990, 95, somewhere thereabouts. So it was illegal to have a divorce in Ireland. Is that right? Not only illegal, but unconstitutional. Unconstitutional to get a divorce. Absolutely. Uh, it's written into our constitution. Um, Ireland, like America, has a written constitution. So um, it had placed the status of marriage between a man and a woman uh, in, it's in our constitution. So uh, two years ago, we got that out and um, we can have um, gay marriage now. Um, Same-sex couples can get married in Ireland, but it was um, illegal at one stage in Ireland to have a divorce. Yeah, well. I was going to bring up the same-sex marriage thing because I, I think I was there right about the time that that uh, you guys legalized same-sex marriage. And I remember you guys were both act activists for that as well. Yeah, that, that was 2015. Yeah. We, we've had, to put it in context, our constitution was put in place in 1937, at a time when Ireland was a very Catholic country. The uh, constitution opens by saying that all authority comes from the Holy Trinity. So that's, that's the, and then it goes downhill from there. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's, uh, it, it started off, and it, it had, um, uh, a special place for the Catholic Church that was removed uh, around the 1960s, but that was removed, nothing to do with secularism. That was removed to try to uh, make uh, our, the Republic of Ireland a more attractive place for Protestants in Northern Ireland. It was still a very kind of sectarian thing rather than, than a secular thing. But we, we've had so many things wrong with our constitution that we gradually began with, the, particularly the, the ban on uh, divorce, uh, the ban then on uh, gay marriage, and now yeah. the ban on abortion. But the abortion one is so symbolic because that, yes. it's kind of at the bedrock of Catholic theology. It's the one that mm -hmm. they expected to be able to hold on to. And, and that particular ban was only put into our constitution in the 1980s. And in fact, it comes down to, to you guys over there, after Roe versus Wade, there were people in Ireland, Catholics in Ireland, encouraged by Catholics in America to say, look, you might get a Roe versus Wade case in Ireland. Uh, so you need to copper fasten the already, you know, unlawfulness of, of abortion by putting a constitutional ban as well. So that constitutional ban was put in in 1983. And, and so we've had 35 years of, uh, of trying to get rid of that, that, that ban. Now, there was a safety valve to some extent, which is everybody on both sides of the debate recognised that women would still travel to England to get abortions or the Netherlands. Um, but then in, 90, in, the, in the early 1990s, there was a 14-year-old girl raped um, and she was pregnant and she wanted an abortion and her parents were bringing her to uh, England for an abortion. And they asked the police, can we use DNA from the fetus in the court case against the person that's been accused of raping our daughter? And the response of the state, having been officially told that, was to take out an injunction against this raped 14-year-old girl child. to stop her from leaving the country. So that resulted in a public outrage and a slight liberalisation of the law, but they still didn't um, push the, 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 the type of um, recognition into the law of when you could now get an abortion. And so it, it's built up and up and up again. And then, Jane, do you want to talk about the Savita case? Savita uh, Kalapanavar was uh, an Indian woman um, a few years ago in Ireland, and she was pregnant. But at 17 weeks, she started to lose the baby. And it was a welcome pregnancy. Herself and her husband were delighted that they were uh, pregnant and she went into a hospital in Galway 
when she was losing the baby. And because there was still a heartbeat, they wouldn't do an abortion. Now, she did ask for an abortion. She went in on the Sunday and she asked them for an abortion on Sunday and on the Tuesday. And by Wednesday, it was too late. They wouldn't do the abortion because uh, the fetus still had a heartbeat and she got sepsis and she died. It was far too late on the Wednesday either, even, you know. So this was huge. You had this young woman, vibrant, full of life, and she died because of uh, the abortion laws in Ireland and that ban in our constitution. It was simply too late on the Wednesday. The sepsis had st set in. It was just like that. It is such a quick thing, sepsis. And um, she, we, she was gone. And her parents, um, in this uh, campaign, asked for her picture uh, to be used and for to remind people of what happened to their daughter when their daughter was pregnant in Ireland, that their daughter died. And yes, last night we heard that they thanked the Irish people for voting um, that ban on abortion out of our constitution. I understand that the vote that took place, that there were like people in, in foreign countries that flew back home just to vote on this. Absolutely. Um, it was That was part of the campaign to get people to come home. My own niece, she had been traveling over in the Far East and uh, she made sure that she had her ticket home to vote. And, and a lot of um, other people that were um, working in the UK, they all came home to vote. And our own Ashley O'Brien, her sister um, was is abroad working for a few months and she came home as well. So there was a huge thing of in the airport and um, people being welcomed home to vote. And yesterday at um, at the hotel where Together for Yes, the campaign for uh, repealing the Eighth Amendment, there was all the group of uh, different people. And one of those was um, a lot of people that had come home to vote. And it was great to be able to see them there and talk to them. We were delighted with that. It was a, it is emotion, so emotional yesterday for many of us that have fought in this campaign for so long and remember all those issues, the X case. It is so wearing to be a woman sometimes in Ireland and to uh, to see what happened when Savita died and everything. It's, it's wearing at this stage of my life and I'm so glad that that Eighth Amendment is gone. I'm so, so happy today to see the back of it. Yeah. And we move forward and put in legislation uh, now and as the government has said yesterday that it will move as soon as possible to get legislation in place to reflect that momentous change yesterday. And it was momentous, it was a landslide in our favour. And none of the opinion polls um, reflected that it was going to be like that, except for the exit polls um, on the night after everybody voted, that's all. But it seems that all the don't knows voted yes to remove it. So, and that may have been, you know, people, because people were concerned, or people on our side were concerned, that the, the don't knows, you know, don't knows can tend to uh, swing for the status quo in, yes. in elections and referendums. But the, the, it looks as if a lot of the don't knows might have been people who maybe had had, had abortions or knew people who had had abortions, mm -hmm. but just didn't want to talk about it. Yes. And, and they came out for, for yes to an appeal in the end. And what, what's, there are several great things about it. First of all, it's an end to this horrible pattern that we've had of legislating in the minimalist way on abortion in response to personal tragedies. That, that said, that these slight little tiny changes every time somebody dies or, or a high profile rape case and so on, but now that's out of the way. Now they can legislate properly for abortion. The second thing is when that referendum was brought in, or that amendment was brought in first in 1983, it was a two to one majority to bring it in. It was still quite, it was almost the, the peak of Catholic influence um, before it started to, to decline in Ireland. But it was a two to one majority that was brought in by 1983. This time around, it was repealed by a two to one majority. It's exactly reversed now. We, we, we have a, an overwhelming majority of Ireland people, Irish people, voting on the basis of compassion and human rights and respect for individual conscience instead of 
imposing people's beliefs on, on, on others. And I'm sure there are some people who voted yes, there must have been given the scale of it, people voting yes, who disagree with abortion and who are Catholics and thinks that abortion is wrong, but they respect that other people have different conscientious beliefs and that the essence of, of living in, in a pluralist state and country is that you should respect other people's beliefs to act according with their conscience on issues like this, where, where there isn't a settled moral consensus such as there is on murder and robbery and slavery and, and, and issues like that. For any Christians that might be watching and, and wondering why atheists are celebrating an abortion, abortion rule like this, if, of course, the important thing is is that we're not necessarily talking about people's different consciences, or which, which can apply. But the examples that were given here were matters of of health and urgency. And when when an abortion is needed, or it is for whatever reason, if you're going to decide on a deport, it abortion, it needs to be done quickly, as quickly as possible, so that you you don't have you don't want to evolve a court system. You don't want to have to get a um, you know, a, a doctor and then a judge to make a ruling on it because of you know how quickly complications can arise, as you were saying in this in this other example. And there are cases of of rape and incestual rape and other things that you don't want to have other people making a judgment on. And very often you wouldn't want to have other people even know about, you know, in yes. in the ideal situation. So just I say this just for any religious people who might be watching this, wondering why we're celebrating an abortion ban. Yeah. I don't expect them to understand the significance of the symbolism. Yeah, because it is, you're right, because it's not like the gay marriage referendum yeah. three years ago, which was something that you could actively celebrate. You can celebrate, you know, that the love of two people and, mm. and, and them wanting to spend their lives together. This was a different type yeah. of tone to the campaign because, you know, abortion isn't something that people want. It's just, a, it's an unfortunate necessity yeah. in, 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 uh, yeah. in crisis pregnancies. But, it, but it's not just crisis pregnancies. It's also, it's not just when people don't want to be pregnant. It's also, there are couples that do want to be pregnant. You know, they may have even got IVF to, to try to become pregnant, but then, their health is threatened, or they have a, a fetus that is a fatal abnormality and that isn't going to survive. And in those cases, you know, you, you need to have a compassionate approach. We've had horrible situations yes. here where, where a, a group uh, campaign of, of you know, parents who, who uh, have had fetuses with fatal abnormalities, who have had to go to England to, to ha have the abortion because they, they will be forced to continue with the pregnancy here. And then they have to, you know, bring the, the fetus's body home in, 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 in a coffin on, on the ship from yes. England. You know, it's just absolutely yeah. horrendous in, 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 uh, in terms of the, the lack of compassion that, that our, our state has and shown was, up to There now. was a ban on that. If there were, it was a couple and they had a, a fatal fetal abnormality and they decided that they wanted an abortion. They couldn't get it in Ireland. We did that as a country. We wouldn't help these people. We let them go to another country. They had to get the plane or the boat over to another country. And they did this in secret and alone. And they went over, in many cases, to the hospital in Liverpool, where they had an abortion. And they did, as Michael said, brought the remains of their baby back to Ireland to bury. That is what we did to women and uh, um, their partners. That is what we did to them, and that is going to change. And if you had, if you have taken an abortion pill, even, and you're not, you're only eight weeks gone or something like that. You could, if you're, if you're caught, you could. The law says that you get fourteen years in prison for that. That is in our legislation. Nobody has been. It hasn't happened yet, but it is in the legislation. You could get 14 years. Now we have to get rid of that very quickly uh, uh, from yesterday. You know, we have to, that has to go and uh, um, and legislation has to be put in place um, that we can ensure um, proper healthcare and reproductive rights for women in Ireland. And that's what we really are hoping for. Yeah, of course I'm, I'm in Texas and they've, they've tried to, uh, they've tried to initiate policies where they, they they insist that you name the fetus before it's aborted or that you, you're required to listen to a, an ultrasound. And they, they want to do ev everything they can to get the mother to commit, even when they know that it is inviolable, even when they know there's no chance of survival. 
Yes. They, they still they would still force a woman to endure an entire pregnancy and then all the pain associated with that, with the yeah. with the the live birth for something that wouldn't even survive. Yeah. It's it's insidious and stupid, especially when, you know, on top of that, then the next thing they're going to do is, you know, the, 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 the pro-lifers are all about the life of the unborn fetus. But once it's born, well, then they've taken away all the rights. You know, there's no more. They, 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 they've done everything it can to to minimize or eliminate uh, yeah. women and infant children's programs and anything that would benefit yes. unwed mothers and so forth. All of the welfare that would help with this. So they created a positive feedback, which, of course, you know, negative results so that we end up with a quarter of our population in Texas being under the poverty line, and it just keeps perpetuating itself. Yeah, they're, they're essentially pro-birth rather than pro-life. A forced birth. Forced birth. That's what I think they are. That's what they seem to want to do. Now, if a woman does have a fatal fetal abnormality and wants to go through with it, that's fine. We don't have a thing that is an issue, but that is her choice. But there are many women that can't, they have other children. They can't watch and, and have people asking them, well, how are things going? You know, how's your pregnancy going? And, and people in Ireland do that. You know, we, we, we're we friendly. We talk to the neighbors if somebody's pregnant and we'll say, how's things going? How far along are you? You can't expect a woman to be going down the street and to answer questions like that and to st say all the time, like, like my, my baby is going to die. It's only going to take a few breaths. It might live a day or something. <laughs> It's cruel and inhuman to expect that. And um, the Irish people saw that that is cruel and inhuman. And we have compassion as an Irish people that we're not going to continue to do that to families anymore. That is why the landslide yesterday. We are so delighted with that. So that getting off of the, the subject necessarily of abortion, then I want to talk more about the progress in Ireland from like the 1990s with the, the, the divorce ruling and and, and other things. I mean, how bad had it been and, and where is it going to be going now? Well, in 1990 or 1991, uh, the Virgin Megastore, which is a, a it's Richard Branson's brand, uh, a record store and, and music store, was taken to court and fined for selling a condom. So that's where we were in 1990. Yeah. <laughs> we did a court. Wait, what? <laughs> Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's where we were then. We, we, we had condoms were illegal yeah. uh, for, for a long time. Then they were made legal, but only if you were married and had a doctor's prescription saying that you required them for bona fide family planning purposes. So that's how bizarre we were back, back in the 1980s. It just takes me a minute to absorb that because this is, I've been to Ireland a few times. I love Dublin. I love Northern Ireland as well. I mean, yeah. I, I love your island, but um, I'm not familiar with this. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then on another level, Aaron, uh, the IRA, um, who were conducting terrorist organizations and, and murdering people, um, used to use condoms as a protective device as part of the timing mechanisms when making bombs. And there were some IRA members that were opposed to using condoms on moral grounds. <laughs> Okay, and, and on that note, since you've mentioned the IRA, I should probably also bring up that I'm aware that uh, it may raise a few eyebrows for people in Ireland to realize that you are on the Raw Men podcast. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah, people in the United States will not understand that. I'm not sure I understand that. Can you explain that? Yeah, well, the, the, the RA is, is a shorthand for the IRA as in the RA from RA and, and up the RA is one of the phrases that the uh, that IRA people have, have used over here in the past. So yes, um, yes, I have to say, uh, had it been a different type of RA, man, I wouldn't be on this podcast. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm so really just, I'm amazed that, and then it's also ironic that it would be Virgin would be the company that would be selling the condoms. Yeah. And Branson's obsession with not having been impaled. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in terms of that scale that you were talking about, back then we had divorce uh, uh, was still illegal. There, there, there was a constitutional referendum in the 1980s to try to make divorce constitutional. And it was defeated. And then, then there was another, another one, one in 1995 that, that successfully 
made divorce yeah. constitution. But even that was very helpful. Something oh. like 51, 49. One percent. vote in every ballot box. Yeah, it was very, very tight. Yeah. Um, but, but what has happened since then, and I don't think the politicians have caught on to it yet, is the population have gradually moved on. And the Catholic Church does not control the population in the way that it used to. But it still has laws in place from when it did control the people. And those laws include uh, running 90% of our primary schools, uh, running most of our hospitals. There are still exemptions, exemptions from our Equality Welsh Acts. Yeah. Um, exemptions from an Equality Act? What is that? Yeah, that, that, that Catholic right. schools and, um, and hospitals are allowed to discriminate on yeah. the ground of religion and employment. Yeah. Um, there are religious oaths for uh, president and, mm -hmm. and uh, judges. Um, now, they're different from your religious oaths. You actually have a very strange thing in America, as I understand it, that the president, when he's swearing, uh, being sworn in, says, so help me God at the end of it. But that's not actually in the wording. It's just something that's... It's not in that's, the Constitution. That's, it's added on by tradition. Yeah. Yeah. There was a case that, uh, that somebody talked about that. Uh, we're the opposite. We, we literally have the words written into our Constitution that the president and judges have to ask God to direct and sustain them in their work. So a conscientious atheist could not become president or a judge or indeed prime minister in, in Ireland. And that is serious discrimination, if you think about it. Very, very serious discrimination. So we have to have a referendum to remove religious oaths from our constitution to be a president or a judge or a member of the Council of State. So that is on the cards. And that is, is hard to think that anybody would uh, fight against that, removing them in a pluralist Ireland. But we uh, we'll wait and see that and we're hoping um, that we can get move forward and get referendums on that. And also later this year, we have blasphemy. Uh, a blas blasphemy is written into our constitution as well. So we need a referendum on blasphemy. So that is, as well as moving forward, we'll have a rest for a few days, I think though. As well as moving forward on to camp against discrimination, particularly in the education system, we're gonna now have to work um, to campaign on removing blasphemy from our constitution, which will be held later this year. But the beauty of this, Aaron, sorry, the beauty of this, Aaron, is that up, up to now, there has been a concern among politicians. They've been very conservative on these issues. And part of it, I think, is they're afraid that, the, that they're, because most people still nominally say that they're Catholic, they're afraid that if they move too far ahead, um, that, the, that they might be rejected by the people. And, and also a lot of the politicians will be more conservative than the population generally anyway. So, so but what's beautiful about this referendum result is it, it gets that out of the way. Yeah. If the population that is, that is nominally 80% Catholic, is prepared to vote two-thirds to one-third for the right to abortion, which is one of the bedrock things that the Catholics would, would consider absolutely sacred to their beliefs, yeah. then that, that gives us a lot of optimism for, for yes. pushing other secular issues um, over the next few years. And on issues, we were concerned that if it was lost, um, what would we do? Because we have a campaign and there's Catholic sex education in schools, you know? And we were worried that how would we continue to campaign um, against that and to fight that if this referendum was lost? So it does affect our other issues in relation to the different campaigns we have. So uh, we, it's onward and upward um, from yesterday that we can continue to, to say to the politicians and sit there when we're, we have to speak on these issues and say, look, it might be nominally a Catholic uh, uh, country and a lot of people might say that they are Catholic, but that doesn't mean that they want Catholic sex education. They have voted to, uh, um, to get the ban on abortion out of our constitution. So you cannot uh, say that um, the children in Ireland have to be told that, um, abortion is wrong and it's a moral issue and it's wrong and it's killing somebody you cannot say that in a sex education class to our children anymore and that is where we can go with that yeah i wanted to touch on something else and i, and I know we, you and i have probably talked about this before uh, on the blasphemy thing that was the reason that the world atheist convention was held 
uh, in Dublin in 2011 was because of the blasphemy law. We were like taunting the, gov the, the government to come and get us. And at the same time that that was going on, and I didn't know, didn't know about this then, but there was a, uh, an American Catholic, uh, a strong right-wing uh, advocate called Michael Voris was in Dublin also, unaware that we were there. And he was conducting a poll on the street to find out how many people were still Catholic because it was a Catholic country, it's run by Catholic laws, and yet he couldn't find much of a Catholic populace there. So um, you're talking about nominally, nominally 80%, but he interviewed 20 people, and out of them, one admitted that they still believe in God. So he got 19 atheists and one believer out of his poll, and he was very frustrated by that. And this was on the same day that the atheist convention was going on down the same street, which, like, like I said, we weren't aware of each other. Yeah, I, I think he was probably lucky to get 19. I think that's probably a bit high. Yeah, so probably, uh, but, but certainly... No, did I say that right? It was 19 people who, who were atheists and one person yeah. who still believed in God. No, yeah, I, I didn't. Much as I would like that to be representative, yeah. I think he was probably lucky in the people that, that he got there. But I still think that, that yeah. most people, most people who are nominally Catholic, they there was a, a an opinion poll of Irish Roman Catholics, self-declared Roman Catholics, around the time of the Eucharist Congress in Ireland a few years ago. And 75% of them didn't believe in transubstantiation, which is one of the key Catholic tenets, you know, that, that, the, that the bread and wine at mass literally, literally become the body and blood of Jesus as opposed to symbolically. That's supposed to be one of the core reasons that Catholicism is different than Protestantism. Uh, so 75% of them didn't believe in that. Um, half of them didn't believe in hell. Uh, Something like 15% of them didn't believe that Jesus was the son of God, which you'd think would be pretty core to being Catholic. Oh. And my favorite was 8% of them, of self-declared Roman Catholics, oh. said they didn't believe in God, which again, you would think would be a very low hurdle for being a, a Catholic. <laughs> now, most, most significantly, we have two thirds of the Irish people, yes. most of whom are nominally Catholic, uh, voting for the right to abortion. It's strange in Ireland, Catholicism, it is a bit different than other countries because it has integrated completely into our culture. So, and that, that's why they call themselves the nominally Catholics. They could follow all the rules and the the they make, have their kids make their Holy Communion and Confirmation, but that doesn't mean that they actually believe in it. It, it is what the Catholic Church does, how they evangelize, they integrate the religion into the culture. But in this instance, it seems to have backfired because you've got uh, um, people that would say they're Catholic, follow a lot of the rules, but are not committed to their faith. It's just part of what you do to be Irish, kind of, they see it. You know, the schools are Catholic, they'll, they'll have their children make their communion, but they never put their foot inside the door, the church door, for the rest of the year. And that is what is happening. And they get their children baptized so they can get them into the local school because you can discriminate on religious grounds um, in our schools, publicly funded schools. And that is is the way it is in Ireland. It it has integrated into the culture, but it has un actually undermined uh, what we would refer to as religious faith. It has doing that, that kind of evangelism has undermined faith in Catholicism, because they don't really believe in it. They just go along with it. But I'll, I'll tell you how bad it was um, much more le recently than uh, the 1990s. Mm -hmm. When Atheist Ireland was found, founded about 10 years ago, we're 10 years old this year. When we were founded, one of the first things we started doing is going to meetings of, of uh, other human rights organizations and civil society groups um you know to to get the secular agenda onto the overall agenda of human rights groups and back then we discovered that even the human rights organizations when they were campaigning for example against the the exemptions in our equality laws that yeah. allow religious schools to our state-funded schools to discriminate on the grounds of religion yeah. they weren't saying you have to get rid of that discrimination they were saying you shouldn't be allowed to abuse the right to discriminate on the grounds of religion to also discriminate on the grounds of sexuality or gender or you know marital status and we were kind of stunned at this and we we're saying no you shouldn't be allowed to discriminate at all on the ground of religion and so so we, we were starting off 10 years ago 
just trying to get the human rights organisations to recognise that you shouldn't be allowed to discriminate religion. on the grounds of religion. Yeah. It was that embedded into the culture. Yeah. And, and, but now we're, we're really pleased at, at yeah. the, the progress over the last decade. Yeah. When we started off, if we were doing a, a radio or television interview 10 years ago, we'd have to spend half the interview telling people what atheism is and what secularism is yeah. before we get around to discussing what we want to discuss. You know, our first task was just normalizing the words atheism and secularism. Mm -hmm. And now they're at the core of the agenda and, and the political discourse. And, and we're pretty optimistic that it's going that it's going to get better over, over the next few years. Uh, yeah. Except for except for the twenty five percent of Catholics who say that they don't believe in God. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I find it amazing that how many people will will just consider religion to be a cultural thing. It's like it's like you're supposed to choose the uh, you know the, the the local sports team and wear their jerseys. That's the way religion is treated. You know, so you've got to put on the the blue and gray and say go Cowboys. It's if it, you know if if you lived here, for example. And that just seems, we, when we were in Northern Ireland, we were talking about something similar, how the religion seems to be attached to the sports teams. It's, yeah, yeah. It, and, and so it, that's that's what I see of it. I mean, it's not that do people necessarily believe any of it. Although I did meet, I met one, this one Catholic girl when she identified as Catholic. I said, okay, so why are you Catholic? I, why do you say that you're Catholic? Is it because you think that everything that the Pope says is infallible? And she stared at me blankly for a moment and said, what's a Pope? <laughs> yeah, there's such tribalism in it. And yeah. I mean, ultimately, it is tribalism. I mean, I actually see it as very close to nationalism. You know, I, I think that nationalism is pretty close to religion in, in that it's, it's identifying with people on the basis of some abstract random thing rather than on the basis of actual shared experiences and values. Just because you happen to be born into a particular tribe, you're supposed to support that person, whether they're right or wrong. And, and you know, I, I think that that. I always think that the next stage after we manage to separate church and state is trying to separate nation and state and, and try to say you know, a republic should be respectful of whatever your nationality is and treat you equally regardless of, of how you identify. Yeah, I, I have to admit that when I was a child, I, I considered myself very patriotic. I was born in a in a very tribalistic culture, and that you know, ours was not only the best country, but our state was the best state. Our school is the best school. Our religion is the best religion. Our town is the best town, and so on. Yeah, just whatever we just happen to be born into. It's like when you when you go to summer camp and they have you sing the song for your cabin. Well, it's a it's a draw of the lots that you get that cabin. So why are we singing a song the same song everyone else is singing? It's just we're cabin fourteen, so we're better than everybody. How yeah, so, and then they're they're reinforcing that culturally. Yeah, which yeah. is why I'm so embarrassed about how patriotic I used to be, and and you know, whereas I want to believe that you know we're number one and so forth, I've been to a number of other countries, and I'm envious of a lot of other things that they do. A lot of other countries do things more, do different things. You know, they all have different advantages, but they all do different things better than we do, yeah. more, than more conscious than we are. And rather than boast that we're number one, I'd like to catch up again. That would that would be kind of nice. Yeah, well, there, there's a, a website um, called the World Values Survey, which is run by a team of interdisciplinary social scientists around the world that examines human values around the world. And uh, it, it's shown some very interesting things. First of all, it's shown that, that as when, when in societies where people are focusing on survival values, um, religion is at its strongest. And as societies move away from survival values and towards what these people call self-expression values, um, which is typically triggered by things like investment in health and education, um, communications technology, moves towards democracy, then societies will tend to move away from uh, traditional religious values and rational values. The place strongest on balance are the Scandinavian countries. So maybe they're the places that we have, the countries that we should be looking at for, for lessons for all our other countries. Yeah, yeah, they seem to be. Right. Well, that's, that sounds like a, a good area to close, unless you've got some other uh, other thing that you need to cover that we haven't already. Well, just to say that we're very pleased with how the, the referendum has gone. We think that the knock-on effect that it's going to have on uh, the campaign for secularism in Ireland will be significant. We're very pleased that, as like you know, Jane and I um, are old enough to have been campaigning on these issues since the first referendum in 1983. Yeah. And we're delighted yeah. to see so many young people getting involved yes. now this Huge time around in, in, in the campaign. There's a new vibrancy and a new, new energy energy there. And then the other thing is is is, is that the the uh, 
the more that, that we can advance on advancing secularism here, the more time that we would have to continue to work with you and others in other countries on the international work that we do um, with, uh, you know, and, and particularly that we collectively in, in, in developed democracies can do to help uh, people in theocracies uh, and, and dictatorships that whatever the problems that we have, that those people have far more problems. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. yesterday, my daughter and I were talking about uh, how frustrating it is to hear other people say that I'm only one person, I can't do anything, so what's the point of even trying? And I might have believed that before I became an activist, but obviously I couldn't be an activist and believe something like that. And I know you guys have been involved in this for like 10 years, and I've been I've been had the pleasure of being there with you on your on some of your successes. So I'm uh, just proud of you both for for the the small bit you've done as just two individuals. And we're looking forward to the next time that you're over as well. Yeah, but the thing about repeal the eighth movement is that it was a grassroots movement. It was young women, uh, mostly young women, but young men as well, from the, the bottom down that mobilized and, and pushed and campaigned, knocked on doors, stood in the street, gave out leaflets, all those things. It was a grassroots movement. And that is what it got through, activism. Activism on the ground, over a long period, it took a few years, but and a very hard work, but we did it and they did it, and it was great to see. So it can be done. It can be done. All right. Uh, that sounds like a closing moment. Thank you Keep both. Fighting.